overflow called Overflow. First, I want to thank you so much again for your generosity uh, in, in, in this church, for being so generous. Most of you are so generous with your giving, so generous with your time. And that is just a huge blessing to, uh, to our community, to our, uh, our, uh, the, the people that we serve, and is just a huge blessing. Now, I know that that is not all of you. I know that that's not all of you, but I want to believe that you want to be generous with your giving and with your time. But I tell you what, maybe some of you are new to church, and you, you just are warming up to the thought of giving. Uh, maybe some of you are scared. Maybe you're like, man, I, I, I don't have enough. Or, or maybe you, you're just not able to be generous yet. Maybe uh, you've thought to yourself, maybe if I have a higher income, or, or maybe if I have a, a higher bank balance, or, or what about this one? If I have a bank balance, <laughs> uh, I've been there before. If my balance does not start with a dash, <laughs> you know, in my bank, uh, it, I can be generous. But uh, maybe if I had just a little less debt, and I've thought all of these things. But maybe today, just hear me out, maybe today we can talk and God can stretch our faith just a little bit, and we can learn what Jesus meant in Acts 20.35 when it says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are such a generous God. Lord, we know this because the foundation of our faith, John 3, 16 says, for you so loved the world that you gave your only son. We thank you for your presence right now. We thank you that, that we can feel your Holy Spirit around us. And we pray that he will, he will speak to us right now and that, we hear, that we will hear your thoughts and your words and your perspective about generosity. Lord, I pray that it not be my words, that it not be my thoughts, that it not be my, my, uh, my opinions, but Lord, all be of you. Hide me far behind the cross so that they only see you. And Lord, that you would stretch our faith to give and that we would overflow with joy. Now open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our ears to what you would have us to learn. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Early in our church, we, it, we were start, Rima was started back in 2013. August 18th was actually our first service in 2013. And we were started with the tenet of generosity. We wanted to be generous. We wanted to give away everything. We wanted to give away anything and everything. And we, and we came from a church that really wanted to sell everything. And, and, and our vision was just to give everything away. The problem with that was that we didn't have anything to give. We had absolutely nothing to give. But we wanted to do it. So, so what we did was we started having free yard sales. And the, and the first one was held at Odenville Civic Center. And, and, and if you're from Odenville, you won't say Odenville. You'll say Odenville. It's Odenville. And it was at the Odenville Civic Center. And we only had a few tables out with just basically junk, right? And we just gave it away. We did flyers and we just gave it away. It was during Christmas time and people were great. And I was like, this is sad. I was looking at the junk and I'm like, no one will want this stuff. But then this little old lady came up and she picked up a thing of plates. And she picked them up. And she said, how much are these? We were like, it's free. It's a free yard sale. 
take it. <laughs> Please, we'll load it for you. <laughs> she said, this is so cool. She said, see, I don't have enough money to, to, to get my children anything for Christmas. I don't have enough money to, to, to get my grandkids anything, my children anything. But I can cook. And now I have something nice to put that food on for Christmas. Oh, man. Our, our hearts just leapt. We were like, do you want us to buy the food too? And I think we did. I think we actually, we, we actually gave them some food too. And we started doing that annually. So much so, we've stopped doing it so far because we've focused on different things. But so much so that we have had people even now that will drop random things off on our front porch for us to give away. We haven't started it back. We haven't done it in a few years, but they still know our church as the church that does that. Now, our leadership today, our leadership team, has foundational tenets that we hold to, and one of those is we will lead the way with irrational generosity because we truly believe that it is more blessed to give than to receive irrational generosity. That means that we will bet the farm on anything just to win people to Jesus. I'll give away every single thing in this, in this house if it means that you come to the Jesus. Lights, sound, none of that matters. What matters is souls. That's what it's all about. If you will, turn to first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, that they were freely willing, pleading us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. Paul is weird. Paul, Paul writes weird. He does run on sentences and all kinds of stuff. And my English teacher would have read all over that page if, if, if he, she was greed, grading it. But let me just tell you this. The people of Macedonia were absolutely poor. I mean dirt poor. Who can relate? Hallelujah. So they were absolutely dirt poor. And yet, Paul is using them as an example to the church in Corinth of rich generosity. Why? Because even though they had so little, they gave so much. Even though that they had so little, they gave a ton and they wanted to give more and they were excited about giving and they wanted to give more yes. in joy. Yes. Because it really wasn't about the amount. It was about the mindset. It wasn't about the amount. It was about the mindset. So many times, I believe that we have mindsets that limit us. In everything, we have mindsets that limit us. They hold us back. The church of Macedonia were literally begging Paul, let us give, let us pour into this ministry, let us bless you. And they had overflowing joy when they were able to pour into his ministry in spite their extreme poverty. And sometimes we have mindsets that we don't really realize our limitations. And today I want to look at three of those mindsets today. Number one, the mindset of not enough. Not enough. And by the way, I'm guilty of every single one of these. Not enough. Maybe you're saying, I just don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough energy. I don't have enough, uh, enough 
patience to deal with people. Hallelujah. There's a limited amount of resources and, and I just don't feel like I have enough. What's interesting about this is that I know people that have $100 in their pocket at every single time that I see them and they feel like they don't have enough. I know people that have $1,000 in their pocket that can pull out a wallet, give you $1,000 and never bad an eye, but they feel like that they don't have enough. I know people that really have millions of dollars in their bank account, but they feel like they don't have enough. Because why is this? Because not enough is not an amount. It's a mindset. Not enough is not an amount. It's a mindset. See, we serve an abundant God. That should make 10 people happy. We serve an abundant God. Who not only wants to meet the need, but wants to go a step further and meet other people's needs through us. It's not only about you. It's not about you. Did you know you weren't saved for you? You were saved so other people can know Jesus. We need to change our, our mindset from this not enough mindset to we have more than enough. We have more than enough. Let me tell you something. I hate church fundraisers. Cannot stand them. I think sometimes we have more church fundraisers than, than anything. I feel like sometimes people don't know if they're pulling up to the Dollar General or to the church. I tell you what, I've never read in the Bible where Jesus said, hey, I see 5,000 people, I'm going to feed them. But everyone put in a donation of $5 before I feed you. He didn't take the little boy's lunch and say, all right, for a donation of $5, you can get a fish and some loaves. And giving will help the ministry of me, the Son of God. I'm over here trying to save people. So put your money in the basket for this fundraiser dinner. I've never read it. It may be in there, but I've never read it. It's not in there, I'm just saying. But anyway, the, the thing is, is that I cannot stand church fundraisers. I can't stand bake sales. We did, we did a, a pulled pork fundraiser. I couldn't stand that. You know why? I had to pull the pork. <laughs> the pastor pulled the pork. I believe that in God's economy, the math just doesn't add up. I believe that if you're doing God's work, God's money is going to be there. I believe that if people do what they're supposed to do in giving, you don't have to ask other people for money. I believe that if you are obedient, when God says give, I believe that you don't have to do a fundraiser. I believe that you don't have to worry about where the money is going to come from. Amen. See, God provides and gives us more than enough, even when we're not sure if we have enough. Amen. Yeah. See, God's economy is wacky. I mean, it's just whacked out. Like, God's economy is so weird. And here's how it works. When you give to God, you don't lose anything. Let me tell you how this works. Walmart's economy is that if you go to Walmart and you buy something, you lose that money. And you gain some item from China. 
or some other place. But God's economy isn't like that. God's economy is that when you give, you actually gain something. You gain the opportunity to participate in what he's doing. You gain the opportunity to participate in lives being changed. You gain the opportunity to participate in in souls knowing Jesus. You get the opportunity to participate in things that you wouldn't even believe. I can't go overseas sometimes. I I have two children and a wife that says stay home. Sometimes I can't go overseas, but my money can. My money can. Because of you, there have, been or, there have been orphans in Haiti that have had food. Because of you, there has been a, a, a church built in Panama. Because of you, there has been, there's been multiple people fed. Because of you, there's been families that have had power and water. There, because of you, there's been, there's been all of this. And that was from a church. Not of thousands, not of hundreds, but of tens of people. How is that possible? How is that possible? It's possible because of Jesus Christ. Because of God's economy. It's it's amazing when you look at it. A church of our size should not be able to do the stuff that we're able to do. But we do it. Why? Because when you give, you don't lose anything. You gain the opportunity to be a part of it. But you may be thinking right now, well, pastor, it's easy. It's easy for you. I I remember uh, when I took over the church, I took over the church with more bills than money. You can call the previous pastors and ask them. They'll, They'll tell you. We had more bills than money. Took over the church in September and December, I looked at my leadership and I said, everything that we take up, we're going to give away. All the offering, all the tithes and everything will go away this this month. And they were like, excuse me? I said, it's going to happen. We're going to bless people this, this, this Christmas. That Christmas, we wanted to bless more people, but we were only able to bless one family. But the thing is, is that we blessed the socks off of that family. We went to, we went to Walmart, and usually we're, we just, you know, take a cart, and we would just, you know, add a few things or whatever. We had two <laughs> big old carts full of stuff. And I remember we were, we were like going through Walmart. Jackie will tell you, we were going through Walmart, putting stuff in and the woman and and one woman looked at us and said, Oh my goodness, someone's going to have a happy Christmas. Who is it? And we were like, we don't know. (laughs) We were like, this is our church. Our church is sponsoring a family. And she said, Oh, a family one. I said, yeah. And she said, oh, well, our church is doing three. And she had one buggy. And I was like, hey, God gave us the funds. We're going to bless the socks off of a family. The next year, I was like, all right, we're doing it again. Hallelujah. We did one family this year. We're going to do more. We're going to double it. Hallelujah. We did five. This year, we're doing it again. And I don't know how many we're going to do, but God's going to provide. God's going to do something amazing in this. Last year, there were people that that ate on Christmas because of Rima Worship Center. Last year, there were people that, that had something under the tree because of Rima Worship Center. Last year, there were people that had trees because of Rima Worship Center. And it's not because of anything that I do. It's it's not anything about leadership. It's about Jesus. 
But you may be thinking, Pastor, it's easy. It's easy to spend other people's money. It's other people's money that you're spending. It's not your own. And that's a really good point. In fact, that's going to be my next point. We need to change our mindset from my resources to God's resources. See, we serve a God that is so generous and provides for us so much, and we have to realize that everything we have actually comes from Him. Not from us. It's not ours. If you're married, you get this concept. If you are a man and, and you're married, you get this concept. And the reason why is because when I first got married, I thought the money that I made was mine. <laughs> because it had my name on it. It's not. It's not yours. It's God's. Or your woman's. But David talks about, about being, uh, it being God's resources in 1 Chronicles 29 and 14. It says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. You see, when, when you start to gain the perspective that everything is God's, I'm not spending my resources. I'm, I'm giving God back what He's given me. Yeah, that's right. It makes it easier to give. It makes it easier to do it because I'm not, I'm not spending my resources. I'm simply stewarding back what's His. We need to move our mindset from my resources to God's resources. And when we do that, something changes in us. You start looking for ways to bless people. And and, and God has, you think, God has given me these resources. What can I do with them? You also have to realize that, that we serve an abundant God who, who not only will provide for my needs, but wants to bless other people through me. We're just managers of God's resources. I remember one time I was sitting back in, in the sound booth at a VBS, and every VBS at, uh, at Rima, we, we take up money. Uh, we, we take up an offering. And this year, I think we were taking up money to, to like, dig wells in Africa or, or, or something like that. I, I actually forgot what it was. We did three years of VBS, and, and we did it every year. It was something like that. It was awesome. And I was very passionate about it. And those children, like 20-something children, raised $800 in a week. I'm like, good Lord, this is amazing. It was 800 and something dollars. It was an odd amount, and it didn't sit right with me. And Kirsty and I were struggling that week. We were, we were just, I mean, we, we didn't have money. I mean, plain and simple. Thank God they were feeding us at VBS, because otherwise we were having peanut butter and jelly at home. Right, but they were feeding us like hamburgers and, and like some good stuff, like lasagna, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I was thankful. I was like, hallelujah, we're going to VBS. <laughs> I was thankful for it. And it didn't sit right with me that it was 800 and some odd dollars. It was an odd amount. And so on the last night, I sat back there and I, I was part of the team that actually counted the money and, and you know, totaled up the everything or whatever. And they said, it, they announced the whole total for the, for the night or for the, for the week. And I said, Kirsty and I will make it an even thousand. It wasn't a big deal. I didn't want to be a hero. I just felt led to give. We didn't have anything. I mean, nothing. It was coming out of emergency fund. 
I had not talked to Kirsty. I had not done anything. I just said, we'll make it an even thousand, Pastor. They said, all right, a thousand dollars, dig wells in, in Africa. And, and I believe that that will dig like five wells or something like that. It was amazing. I loved it. But I didn't, I didn't talk to, talk to uh, Kirsty about it. Kirsty was as shocked as me when I said it. But see, I wasn't giving of my resources. I wasn't giving of, of my money. I was giving back God what was His. I was, I was giving of, of His resources. And let me tell you this. We didn't lose our house. Our power didn't cut, get cut off. Our car didn't get repossessed. We didn't, we didn't lose any weight, although we probably should have. God took care of us. We're still here. So what do we know? We know that we need to change our mindset from not enough to more than enough. And we need to switch our thinking from it's our resources to God's resources. And lastly, we need to change our saying from I'll give when to I'll give now. 2 Corinthians 8, 10 and 11, it says, And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to to be able to do what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. But now you must also complete the doing of it. What's happening here is that just a year earlier, Paul went to them and said, hey, we could use some funds to do this. Remember the Macedonians? And they were like, yes, we'll give. This is going to be great. Woohoo! And then they didn't give. They were excited about it, but they didn't do it. They committed, but they didn't do it. They were excited and they wanted to help and support the church in Jerusalem, but they didn't follow through. What, what Paul is basically saying here is, hey, you need to match your eagerness to give with, with giving. Thanks for being excited about it. Now let's take up the offering. If you want to experience the overflowing joy of the generosity like the Macedonian church did, you can't just have the intentions to give. You can't just have the plans to give. You can't just have the thoughts of one day I'll give. You have to step into it. And you have to be obedient now. God doesn't just want you to have an eternal life, but God wants you to have an abundant life. See, the, the, the thing is, is that we think that we're going to do without if we give. And, and yeah, this, this message is about giving. And there's usually not many amens when the preacher starts talking about money. But what do we do at Rima when I say it's time for the offering? We cheer. Why? Because we're weird. No other church in America says it's time for the offering. Yes! Woo! Why? Because it's our opportunity to invest in the kingdom of God. It's our opportunity to do something great with what God has given us. And what I've learned about giving is it's not too early to begin and it's never too late to start. It's not too early to begin and it's never too late to start. I remember when I was a kid, I was singing on this stage and someone messed up my tie and they took up an offering 
to buy me a new tie. And I don't know how much it was, but I thought I was rolling. I was a baller when I was like five. Okay, I was like, yeah, I, I had a Ziploc bag. Not one of them great value bags, a Ziploc bag full of cash money. I was like, yes. And then my mom hit me with this. Now, you know, 10% of that belongs to God. 10% of it belongs to who now? And she wouldn't let me get away with the two excuses I had. The first excuse was, I'm five and I don't know what 10% is. She said, I'll help you. And number two, God owns everything anyway. Why does he want my money? Seemed perfectly logical to me. She said, no, that's not yours. That's actually God's. And you're just returning back 10% to him. And saying, God, I know that you will take 90% further than you ever would 100%. There's been times, and I just talk about me. I can't talk about any of you. There's been times in my life that I have looked at the checkbook or the online banking, let's just be honest, and looked at the giving site. And if you think the pastor doesn't have the same thoughts as you, you're wrong. Because I've looked at the the checkbook and I've looked at the giving site going, hmm, I don't know. But in God's economy, you never lose. In God's economy, you never lose. You don't own any of it. When you give to the church, you're supporting the body of Christ. You're investing into the kingdom of God. So so here's what I'm asking you to do today. Don't plan to do it. Don't think about doing, not hope to do it. Don't intend to do it. Do it now. Give now. And my prayer for you is just like the prayer for the Macedonian church, that you would be overflowing in joy in your rich generosity. I pray that the more you give, the more joy flows into your heart. And let me just tell you this. This ain't about my salary. <laughs> this ain't about this ain't about anything like that because I don't I don't get a dime. I'm called to do this. This ain't about needing to build anything because God's going to take care of it. This ain't about needing to bless the community because God will take care of that too. This is about you. This is about what you want God to do in your life.